Just briefly to mention a couple of upcoming events that we have. We have uh, two ambassadors events, which are shown on the bottom of the screen. The first one that we have to mark your calendars with is actually tomorrow. We are going to have a guest with us named Anthony Russo. Anthony Russo is a game producer and project manager for Madison Square Garden Ventures. He is also a founding member of For All to Play, which is a small game studio that really focuses or has a key emphasis on accessibility. And he will be discussing game production and design and portfolio development. And that's tomorrow, uh, March 5th at 6 p.m. Then a week from now, we have on March 12th at 3.30, we will have In Full Color. In Full Color empowers women of color and other marginalized groups to tell their stories uh, of, in their own voices, really. And so they will have three presenters that will come and share some pieces with us in the form of poems. And it will be a great event to continue celebrating Women's History Month. And the last event that I'd like to mention is in April, April 6, we will have Finbar O'Reilly, who is a world renowned photographer and co-author of Shooting Ghosts, a US Marine, a combat photographer and their journey back from war. And the last thing is if you want to follow along with our adventures and know more about the Legacy Project, please send us emails um, to legacy at ccm.edu. We also have an Instagram account, CCM Legacy Project, and you could also find us on the CCM homepage um, associated with the Legacy Project. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to now stop screen sharing and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Jill Shenham, who will introduce our guest for today. Okay, hi, I'm Jill Shenham from the Department of Sociology, Economics and Anthropology. So welcome everybody, and especially welcome to Eugenie Mukushimana, who we are just very thrilled to have with us here today. She did come to CCM and speak a few years ago, and it was just such a meaningful experience. So she's gonna be speaking to you today as a survivor of the 1994 Rwandan genocide, right? A uh, uh, genocide in which you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were killed in a very short period of time. Uh, and a genocide that transpired along racialized ethnic lines of Tutu, Tutu, uh, Hutu and Tutsi. Um, so, you know, she, after experiencing, experiencing the genocide, she and her daughter uh, left Rwanda in 2001 for the U.S., were granted asylum within the United States, and um, she pursued a, a bachelor's degree in social work, uh, you know, in part because of, of her experiences and what she wanted to contribute to others. In 2010, she founded Genocide Survivor Support Network, an organization that helps genocide, genocide survivors rebuild their lives. And in 2012, she received a fellowship at Columbia University's Human Rights Advocates uh, Program. Um, so, you know, in her talk, she really talks about, touches on a whole number of themes that you'll see, including, you know, in human rights violations, uh, you know, how important that topic is, how we can address those. Uh, genocide and extreme trauma and how to heal and survive and recover from that as well. Gender violence, um, refugee and immigrant rights, just a whole variety of uh, different topics. Um, one thing I'd sort of just like to point out before I hand it over uh, to Eugenie is, you know, that I think this the, the topic she talks to and what happened in Rwanda in 1994 really resonate with things that we see in the United States as well. And, you know, one thing that I would point to is that, you know, often when social scientists talk about the Rwandan genocide, they sort of naturalize uh, these racialized and ethnic differences between Hutu and Tutsi as innate and eternal, right? But one thing that Eugenie will show us is that in fact, those categories of Hutu and Tutsi had to be historically built. They had to be historically built and then reified. 
Um, and most notably, the building of those identities. It's not like these identities or categories are you know, centuries long and unchanging. In fact, if we look at the history of colonization in Rwanda under first the Germans and then the Belgians, we can really see how those categories come to be constructed and how hostilities um, you know, along the lines of those racialized and ethnicized categories come to be constructed. So I'd just like to point out that today in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement reminds us that in the very same way in the US, racial categories and hostilities, you know, these are not natural and innate. They had to be built through historical processes that were very much rooted in the way the US economy and polity was built, right? And um, categories that can, can be built can be changed also. So I, I think that's just an important sort of comparison between Rwanda and the US. So Eugenie, we're so thrilled to have you and I'll hand it over to you. You have to unmute yourself, Eugenie. You're muted still. There. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for hosting me today. Um, it is very strange to do things over Zoom. I honestly, I'm, I don't know, I would rather be in person, but the uh, current situation doesn't allow. So we're going to try to do the best we can. Um, I am uh, grateful to everyone who's tuning in today. Uh, it's, uh, it's a topic that usually people shy away from and um, it's always a, a blessing to see so many people actually interested in the topic. Uh, There's so many other things that everybody could be doing now, especially when you're a student. There are all those readings that are waiting for you and all those papers that need to be written. So been there, I know that. So thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, so Rwanda is a very complex place. Uh, it is complex in its culture. It is complex in, in its history. And uh, what happened there in 1994, uh, really, um, for me personally, challenged the notion that I had of that place I, where I grew up. Uh, so the Rwanda that I inherited when I, I was born was this wonderful place. I was a kid in the village, uh, a typical African village, no electricity, no running water, a lot of bunch of kids playing around. Any time we got an opportunity to play, uh, a lot of protective parents who are sometimes in your business and tell about your business to your parents and you get in trouble. But at the same time, they will defend you if somebody tries to, uh, to do something uh, not nice to you. So we, I was raised in a village in the true sense of it takes a village to raise a child. And I didn't really have this notion of the differences between me and the other kids I played with. I didn't see the difference um, between different people who came over to my house, uh, to my parents' house. Um, you know, life was good. But behind that, uh, what I could see as a child was a history that I was never told uh, the history of other, um, the violence that had happened in that place before I was born, the history between the Hutus and Tutsis. Now the Tutsis are a minority group, ethnic group, about maybe 15% of the population. And the Hutus were maybe 80, 85% of the population. And we had another small group called the Batwa, a very small minority, maybe 1%. Um, and they have been a history of violence uh, between the two groups, the main uh, ethnic groups before. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna really give you the whole history, but uh, what ha happened before is that the Hutus have tried to kill the Tutsis uh, back in 1959. Uh, they tried to kill them because um, 
the Belgian had said that uh, the Hutus are the majority, so they they should have the power and the Tutsis are aliens, they're foreigners who came over and have taken over their land, basically just get rid of them, reclaim your power, reclaim your land, all good. So a lot of Tutsis at the time, uh, many families, uh, the male and the uh, young men who could fight, uh, they were targeted in that violence. So they, they were killed, others fled the country. So as I was growing up, there was a group of those Tutsis who were outside of the country, have been living there for many years. I had no idea about, and nobody inside the country really spoke about. So, um, and it, us who grew up inside the country as a Tutsi, nobody really talked about it. There was nothing to talk about, uh, I guess, but all the grown-ups knew. Uh, how did I find out that I was a Tutsi? It didn't happen until I went to high school. So when I went to high school, high school in Rwanda at the time, when you went to high school, it's like when you go to college here. So you go away from your home, you go to this, this place, college basically. Um, and when I got there and they gave us a form to fill out at the admissions office, and I, I had a question about your ethnicity and I didn't know how to answer the question. So I skipped it and I got in trouble because um, they the, uh, the lady in the registrar's office thought that I am deliberately choosing not to answer the question. Uh, so she said, you know, like, what's wrong with you people? And I thought you people, like, what do you mean by you people? But I'm new, I'm a freshman. Uh, it's my first day of school. I cannot ask questions. I'm intimidated. I thought maybe she thought I was from the village and she could see it because, you know, I am from the village and this school is in the city. So um, I didn't really think of, uh, of it uh, that much. Uh, and even when I mentioned it to my parents later on, they said, oh, that's not a big deal. You know, like some people are obnoxious, do, you know, just move on no big deal they didn't tell me what they she meant but they knew um later on when i was in high school and then there was a war now i have heard of wars before i grew up on listening to all kinds of war stories on the radio you know throughout africa there were wars in in the um in you know in angola in Western Sahara, there were always wars everywhere. I never thought that a war would come to Rwanda. And because it was at the border and I was living in Chigali, I didn't really think that that war was really, you know, like I was in danger, no. Except that the war changed life for me and many other families. So the war was started by the old refugees who had been living uh, in refugee camps in, in Uganda, the ones who have been chased out of Rwanda back in the 1959. And apparently they've been asking to come back to the country and the government has said no. And the Uganda at the time did not offer any way for them to become either citizenship there or uh, to get citizenship there or to go someplace else. It's just, you live in a refugee camp for 30 years, like, you know, what do you do? and your country is right next door. Uh, we just didn't know. But the fact that they attacked and they were Tutsis meant that every Tutsi now lived in Rwanda uh, became defined as a enemy of the state. We, we were all defined as people who pose a, a security threat to the government. And because of that, and because of the propaganda that started building up, saying, why well, these are also Tutsis. They are supporting the people who are invading our countries, who are coming to kill our wives, and who are coming to take our land. You know, they are a danger. And from there on, the violence increased in the city I lived in. I could no longer go to school in peace and come home in peace. I had to make sure that I, when I get on the bus going back home from school that um, 
when I get to my bus stop, there was somebody that I could recognize who was there. Otherwise, I don't get off the bus there. I go further out. Uh, so you always had to make sure that your, your safety was in check, uh, however you moved. It meant that we could no longer go out and, and play late with the other kids. You have to be home within a certain time and you have to watch out where you're going, which was really hard. And then I started also hearing these harsh words from people passing them on my way from school. They were calling us cockroaches and snakes and they were openly saying, well, we will get you. Now, who was saying these words? On the bus, uh, school bus, there were boys, guys, and even women who just look at us and then just say, you know, yeah, she's one of them. They're one of them. And so we kind of got accustomed to that, but we didn't think that they could really do anything beyond just words. Um, the security guards in the, the military presence in the city because there is a war and my school was very close to different embassies, the, the president's uh, office and uh, embassies. It was a heavy guarded uh, area. So every time we passed people, these men with guns, they would say, yeah, look at them, cockroaches. Uh, we will get you some days. It hurt that somebody could cause you a grouch. Uh, but at the time, you know, I was a teenager. We didn't really spend that much time processing what we was being said to us because we, again, thought these are just words. You know, are you calling me a roach? But I know I'm not a roach, so, but I was young. But now when I think about it, it is the worst thing you can call a human being. I didn't see what they were trying to say at the time, but if you really think of it like a roach, can you, as a human being, can you really have any sentiment, anything positive toward a roach, whether it's a baby roach or a mother roach or whatever kind of roach? There is no way. So in a way, calling people roaches was kind of a way to remove the humanity um, and to dehumanize them. Um, I was young, I really didn't think about it that way, but that's really what it, it was. It, it was one of the ways they used to uh, cultivate this dehumanization, uh, you know, um, sentiment among the average everyday person. So they started, our neighbors started looking at you really as different, even though they have known us all these years. And um, the violence continued. You got now the, uh, the propaganda that was done over the radio. So when I was growing up, there was only one radio station in Rwanda. And uh, because there was only one boring radio station, when the propaganda radio station, a private radio station that was set up really purely for propaganda reasons came about, it became the most popular radio station people could listen to. So evidently, you know, we all turned into that radio station and there was nothing on that radio station uh, other than, oh, the, every problem that the Hutu person might have in the country is because of uh, the Tutsis. Uh, therefore, we, we, the, the rules have to change. They even came up with the 10 Hutu commandment. Now, Rwanda is a Christian country. So if you make something like rules and you make them 10 and you call them commandment, so that has a completely different connotation to it. Um, people took those rules uh, or the commandment as a straight from the Bible. And most of those rules, of course, were really saying why uh, the Tutsis need to be pushed out of any Hutu daily life. You know, you cannot hire them as employees. You cannot have them in the army. You cannot marry them. You, you cannot 
do business with them. Basically, it's complete separation of people who have grown up in the same country doing the same thing. And in, in, in fact, it was really hard to tell a Hutu from a Tutsi because of entailed marriage. People did not see Hutus and Tutsis as a, as a, um, as anything other than, yes, we're different ethnic groups, but we're more alike and we speak the same language, we have the same custom, we go to the same churches, you know, there is really no difference. The differences were artificially uh, defined by the Belgians, uh, basically because they just measured people's noses back in the 30s, 40s, uh, which is, I guess, what they have been doing in Europe, the whole eugenic you know, theories uh, in development at the time. So they measured that, but traditionally in Rwanda, really Hutus and Tutsis was just based on how many cows you had, that's it. And so by the Belgian inserting the height and, and the shape of, of, of your nose and putting down on the paper, they, they made those ethnic, you know, differences uh, a permanent thing which enabled, of course, discrimination down the road. Um, but anyway, so there was this construct of what a Hutu looks like and what a Tutsi looks like. So if I walk down the street uh, and I fit a, a characteristic of a Tutsi, uh, it doesn't matter what my ethnic uh, identity um, will say, uh, they have already formulated in their mind the idea of who I am. I am already in danger if people are just looking at the physical features. So, and of course, because we had those mentions in our identity card, even if you were in the area that people didn't know you and people know you, of course there is, you know, intermarriage or any, you know, they will wanna see your ID card. And if your ID card said, they say mine said that I was a Hutu, uh, if my parents were able to get that done, for example, and they, because they knew that at least I wouldn't be discriminated against in the papers if I went to work sometimes, some days, like many parents, you know, had tried to do, uh, you could still be in danger because now they're accusing you of lying in addition to being a Tutsi. So even that wouldn't be enough. So... But it, it, to being a target, it was very easy from anybody. You couldn't, you couldn't hide and you would know who you, you hide from. Um, but it, once the genocide came about, I was now out of high school. Uh, we had grown accustomed to this environment of a very fragile peace, uh, very violent, and we learned how, where to go and how to go there and how to pretty much just keep ourselves safe. Um, I was eight months pregnant uh, and I was living in Kigali, simple life, but I wasn't involved in politics. Nobody that I knew was involved in politics. So as long as you kept a low profile life and did your business without interfering in whatever was happening politically, you thought you would be safe. Except that when on April 6, when the genocide started, um, and it really started because the president uh, plane was shut down and he was, uh, he was coming from a meeting in Tanzania and he was killed in that plane. And that became the trigger that now uh, the people who had planned the genocide uh, used to tell people it is time now. They have killed our president. They killed our Hutu president. Those Tutsis, you have to go and get them. Go find them, you know who they are. And of course, that language um, was understood by the people who received it. They didn't have to say, go kill the Tutsis. All they said is, you know who did this, they're your neighbors, go find them, cut tall grass, go clean your neighborhood, go cleanse your neighborhood, 
people understood what that meant. And they grabbed the machetes, they grabbed the guns that have been distributed in the city uh, to civilians. Uh, in Rwanda at the time, there was no place you could buy a gun. As far as I know, there was no, there are no shooting range, you know, range where you could go and learn how to use it. You have to be the trained. And although I don't know how and when these people were trained, but some people who have never been in the military all of a sudden knew how to use guns, how to manipulate, you know, hand grenades. Uh, those are all signs that this genocide had been planned. And it had been really out there for us to see we we just somehow couldn't believe that they could actually do it because the propaganda had talked about everything. Um, but we didn't think our neighbors could do this. And we didn't think really that we were the target because we thought this will target, if anything happened, they will target um, politicians and they will target maybe people with wealth uh, because they have something to gain from him. But the average person, we didn't really think A, that our neighbors could be really that bad, but also that we didn't see why they would target us. So when the genocide started, we were all trapped. All of a sudden we are all targets uh, and there's no, there's no place to hide and there's no way to escape. So the plane was down in, in the evening and immediately the government said there is a curfew. Nobody's allowed to leave their homes until further notice. The propaganda radio station started saying that the Tutsi have killed the president and that every Hutu, uh, every good Hutu needs to get up and needs to go find those Tutsis and they have to go, you know, uh, kill them. Which the next morning, of course, uh, nobody's leaving their homes. We lived on a very busy street, so we could see the cars passing by uh, at a speed that is not allowed in in the city. Just if think of uh, your average neighborhood where the speed limit is like twenty, and somebody is is, is driving by going seventy. Um, it's very unusual. Um, but there were also very few cars on the street. So we didn't know actually when the president was killed that he was killed. We didn't know what had happened, but we had this eerie feeling that something had happened because there were no cars on the street and there were no people on the street. And, there, and the few cars that were on the street were driving at a speed that is nowhere close to what is allowed in the area. So we stayed at home just a little bit. We got ready to go to work, dressed up, had tea and coffee and just waited a little bit to kind of get a more clarity of the situation. Uh, it wasn't until about maybe 10 in the morning where we got the news from a neighbor saying that the president had been killed, that the radios, you know, the propaganda ra radio station, the RTLM, uh, had been saying that the Tutsis need to be killed and that they have already started killing people and that nobody's allowed to leave their homes. So we thought, okay, so we're gonna stay home, fine. But we're thinking it's a two day thing. Maybe, you know, just a couple of days, we will be able to go out and the, you know, things will, be, will, you know, will become normal. Um, that same day, uh, we got um, attacked three times. The group that came to our house, the very first group, these are the people that we know, they were next door neighbors. We didn't know the names, but we, we know them. You know, the kind of people you meet at the supermarket all the time and you run into them, you know, at the local daily store where you know they live in the neighborhood even though you don't know their names, but they are familiar faces. So we knew these guys. Um, we take the bus from the same bus stop. We have met them um, in the local, you know, um, bodegas. And they said basically, uh, you are to tease, we are here to kill you. That's what they said when we opened the gate. And they said they want to kill us because they believe, you know, the Tutsis have killed the president. We said, well, we didn't do it. 
They said, well, it doesn't matter. We know you didn't do it. We saw you last night going to buy food across the street, which was true. We didn't have electricity that night, so we couldn't cook. We went to buy grilled chicken across the street. We didn't even see them, but they saw us. But they say it still doesn't matter. We have to pay for the crime. Uh, we thought they were taking advantage of the situation. They wanted money and we just gave them money. We said, you know, go tell whoever that sent you that you have done the job. We're not gonna show our face out there. Just tell them that you killed us. So they left and they said, sure. They said, we'll be back. And sure enough, a couple of hours later, uh, some guys on that first round came back with another group. We didn't have now to negotiate that much. They said, you know why we're here. And we said, yes, we know. So we gave them more money and they left. They say, see you. When the third group came late in the evening, we have run out of money. And these are the same people who are now coming to hit our house the third time. They know how much money we have given before. And what we had was not enough. Uh, so they said, Ronnie, well, you need to get out now. Uh, we finally uh, bargained that they can take some of the valuables from the house, uh, you know, because we don't have enough money. And they agreed to that and they emptied the house. Took everything, one guy grabbed even shit on the bed. Uh, so, by the end of the very first day of the genocide, we are standing in the house that is empty. We run out of money. We haven't cooked. We don't even have groceries in the house. And we're trying to figure out what do we do from, from here on. So we thought it was too dangerous to stay in the house. Uh, and we decided to go to an uh, seek refuge from a friend. So we walked over to this friend of ours we have known for quite some time, you know, very close friend. Uh, when you live in Rwanda, uh, if you leave your house, the way you dress when you're leaving will indicate how far you're going. So we dressed down as down as you could. We didn't grab the, you know, the best outfit or the more fitting outfit. We grab the worst thing you can find in your closet because it will just show that you're going right next door. People don't think you're fleeing. So we left, we, you can't grab a bag. Then people are thinking you're going someplace, you're trying to flee, they become suspicious. So you don't take anything from your house, just the clothes you have on. And we left. We went to this home and when we got there, the husband uh, was not at home. Uh, the wife was there with their baby, uh, about maybe four, maybe six month old son. And um, we explained to her what happened to us. She was genuinely concerned. This is a, a Hutu family that is friend of ours. So she said, sure, you can stay here. So we're comfortable, we, we're safe. And uh, she had made dinner, but we didn't eat because the husband is not home yet. We're waiting for him to come home so we can all have dinner. He came home. Uh, when he arrived, he was dressed like somebody who is going for combat. I don't know where he got the military uniform, but he had it coming on. And he had a gun really strapped like, you know, in all those old, you know, action movies. Um, and he had a different look when he saw us. So he said, you know, what are you doing here the first time? And, you know, no, we thought it was a joke. So I didn't say it, anything. And my husband didn't say anything. His wife didn't know what to, what to say. He repeated himself the second time. And I kind of looked at my husband like, are you going to say anything here? Or he didn't know. Um, the third time the wife realized that she has to speak. And she told him basically what happened to us. And his reaction was, so? And at that time, I think we understood that things have changed. Uh, he said, look, I'm not saying you bad people, but you Tutsis, 
you know, things have changed. You, we are Hutus. We don't have anything to do with each other anymore. Get out of my house. Don't force me to call my friends. So the food is at the table. We haven't eaten all day long. Uh, we got up, we walked outside. We have no plan because we never had a plan A to begin with. This was like a plan A. There's no plan B or plan C. All we know is that we cannot go back to our house and there's no place to go. We really don't have any clue what are we doing. So we walked to a local high school nearby. Um, luckily the watchman was asleep. He had been drinking, I guess, all day long. He passed out on the gate and the gate is open. So we just passed him. We went in the, the big one of the building. We just sat there the whole night. So after that, in the morning, we started hearing again, like more commotion in the area, people are screaming, and then the scream gets louder and louder, and then at some point, no more. You hear more people, we start seeing smoke rising uh, in the, on houses on the hill across from where we were, and some in the neighborhood. Uh, it was dangerous, and the watchman doesn't know that we're in, in at the school. There's no water at the school or anything, but now hunger, you, you're not even thinking that you're hungry. We, we just don't have a clue of how we get out of there and what happens next, where we go. We're scared. In the evening though, we realized that we could not stay in that, in that school. There is no water uh, to drink. Uh, there is no there's no food, we, we can't make it there. And we've been kind of uh, thinking that maybe our friend, uh, he was too scared the night before. Maybe he made up, maybe his wife talked to him, you know, made sense to him and, you know, and maybe if you go back, he will allow us to stay. So we worked out a plan. We escaped the building. We went back to his home. And when we got there though, we got food this time. And that is really the first time that somebody told us, look, a genocide is happening. They didn't really call it a genocide because that word did not exist in the vocabulary we had in Rwanda. All he said is that every treaty is gonna be killed. It's just a matter of time. So I cannot hide you here because they have a list of all the tutsis in the neighborhood and my name is next to your name because in that neighborhood, they made the list of the Tutsi families, but also they made the list of the Hutu friends in the neighborhood, just in case if they don't find them in their home, where are they likely to be? So they made, they added those names. So he said, I cannot keep you here. They will come looking for you here. So we agreed that um, maybe he can find us another person who could hide us and he agreed and he they took us to home uh, the home could only help me but uh, my husband uh, there wasn't room for him so they took him to a different home I stayed in this with this family the family they were a very very poor family like really poor and so when I got there, it was in the middle of the night, they just took my hand, took me to a room. They didn't turn the lights on because the kids were sleeping. And they took me to a room, uh, the children's bedroom, and they pushed me underneath one of the kids' bed, and pushed me underneath there. And uh, I think she got bags and just put underneath the bed so that if the kids wake up and they kind of happen to look under the bed, bed they don't see me and I understood uh, and I knew that I just have to keep quiet but it was challenging because you know it's dusty what if you sneeze uh, what if you, you know if you allow yourself to fall asleep uh, maybe you snore you just don't know so therefore you cannot allow yourself to fall asleep so I stayed up and the next morning, you know, she came and took the kids out and that became the routine. She will come, you know, try to get the kids out of the bedroom, 
try to get them to the neighbors, you know, so to play, she will try to bribe them to leave the house so that I can use the, the restroom. Um, basically, the only way they could keep me safe was to make sure that the kids in the house had no idea that I was hiding there because they might tell the neighbor's kids and the neighbors might call the bad guys. Uh, and of course, the clothes you have on, that's all you keep. You can't take a shower. There's no room. There's no time for that. You can't get your clothes washed. You know, there's nothing else to change into. And I'm pregnant, so I cannot fit into any, just any clothes anyway. So the personal hygiene was the first thing to go out of the window. It didn't matter after some time. And you sit, you sleeping just on a on, on the floor, there's no mattress, there's no blanket. Likely it's not, you know, it's never winter there. So the cold is not something to worry about. Um, but I got used to it. I got used to it. I ate when they were able to feed me some days they couldn't because the kids wouldn't leave the house. And, uh, and that was, you know, had to happen in sequences too. You cannot eat until you have gone to the bathroom. Because if you need to go to the bathroom, and then there is no way to go, and then it's not worth eating, especially when you are, you know, late in your pregnancy. <laughs> uh, it's too much pressure. So uh, your body gets used to it, uh, mind did. And um, hiding alone had some perks, that you know you're not afraid you don't have to deal with someone else going pretty crazy but also you yourself when you go crazy there's nobody to prevent you from doing so um i managed that some to some extent i uh, entertain myself trying to shift my thoughts away from what was happening outside more to like in a surreal world, constructed movies in my mind, you know, made up stories, whatever I could to keep my mind busy. But, you know, there's never, you know, there's, there was always way too much time. Uh, so at some point though, because the family is not participating in the killing, they're not going outside, they're not talking. They, obviously the neighbors became suspicious that they may be hiding people and they raided the house. Uh, one morning, a policeman came in, and with a gang of people from the neighborhood, they said, well, they're looking for a specific person, and they know that they're hiding people, but if they don't find that per per specific individual, they're not going to harm the people they are, they, that this family is hiding. And I can hear this, uh, this the whole conversation. And they said... Um, you tell the people to come out. We don't want to spend our energy looking for them in the house. Just tell them to come back, to come out here for themselves. If we go spend the energy looking for them, we may as well kill them. So the family just say, come out. They didn't say my name. They say, come out. So I thought I was the only person hiding in that home until I got to the living room and with four other women standing there. I never knew that they had more than one person. And as I was walking to the living room, there were only two rooms, basically. There's the room for the kids uh, where I was. There's another room to the side. And the other room was the, you know, the bathroom. So which meant to me the four other women have been hiding in the parents' bedroom. In Rwanda, kids are not allowed to go in the parents' bedroom. So um, they put them there. And I understood why my husband could not hide in that family. There was no room for him. So um, we got there and the guy, of course, he said, well, the guy is not here. Um, but he said, well, these are cockroaches too. Why should we leave them here? So he changed his mind. Um, they immediately, the local, the people from the area, they recognized the four other women. And they said they've been looking for them and they wanted to kill them right there. Um, but the, the women begged and said, you know, we want to go home. You can work with us. You can kill us there. You don't have to do it here. And they agreed. So they marched them. And then they came my turn and they said, well, 
what about her? The family started arguing that I was a relative of theirs who got stuck there. And they said, well, where is her ID card? The family didn't even ask me if I had one. Uh, they knew it would be no, of no use if I did anyway. They said it got stolen on my way uh, to their home. And then I'm thinking now, I've got a problem because they don't know my name. They never asked what my name was. We never talked. Everything was done in silence. And I don't know their names. I just know it's mama somebody and the papa somebody. I don't know where they came to Kigali from. So they're making up a lie that I may have to participate in and we never rehearsed this. Uh, so as they keep asking questions, the families keep answering the questions. I'm thinking, you know, I am done, I am done here. Finally, they agreed that uh, they need to take me to a local official to get me a temporary pass so I can go back where I came from. And that saved my life. So they marched me to this woman's home. She was like a neighbor like a local neighborhood association leader or a local mayor. And when we got there, they took me to a back, to the back of the house and her daughter came out and they negotiated with her mom that I stay there because the daughter actually said, I know this woman and I wanna keep her here. So the family that took me there, they left me there. Now they, um, I got handed over to this woman, except that this woman's job during the genocide was to coordinate the killing in her neighborhood. She ordered guns. She decided who get killed if they brought people like me there. She could just say, take him where you took the others. And the people who brought you there, they know what to do. It's a killing site up the street from her home. So I stay in this home and her daughter is keeping me there. And the only instruction she gave to her daughter is as long as you keep her away from your brothers, but I don't know how many brothers and I don't know how long, and I don't know, I sort of understood why she said that, but I didn't realize until they came home that evening at the dinner table and they started talking. And what did they talk about? They talked about the people they have murdered that day the relationship between them and the people they killed, trying to remind their mother who these people are because they have been at their home on different functions, somebody's birthday or somebody's first communion. The intimacy between their family and the family that they murdered that day and the mother who is laughing, almost getting the stories of what they have done and these are her sons, right? Some listening to all of this and, and I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know what to do. Um, luckily, the daughter kept me safe there and the mother doesn't say anything to her brothers. Uh, she gets bribed every day and the, the daughter was smart enough. She would send the alcohol across the street to a friend of theirs and then say, yeah, he's, you know, your friend said he should stop by. And they go there, they drink and they stay the night there. The next morning they come, they want her to wash their clothes and clean up their machetes and off they go to another killing day. And that got done, I don't know how long I was there. And the daughter, of course, their sister couldn't take it anymore. The very first opportunity she got to leave, she did. She overheard her mother talking to the mayor about an orphanage that needed to be evacuated and they were looking for a chaperone for the kids. And she jumped on the opportunity. She said she will be the chaperone. Her mother thought she would come back, except that she never wanted to come back, so she didn't. So now I'm stuck in the house with the mother and her sons. They are all murderers in that house. And um, except the mother knows I'm there, the, the boys don't know that I'm there. And um, she keeps me there because um, she needs somebody to do her hair because her daughter who was doing it is no longer there. 
she didn't come back. So I did her hair every morning. Uh, she dressed up as if she was going to work to a real job, except her job is really to direct attacks in different homes, um, coordinate the armed civilians kind of like distribution. Um, and that's what she did. And at some point she, I, I don't know whether she had not really noticed how far I, along I was in my pregnancy. She looks at me and she said, you know, you have to go. Um, she said her husband was coming home and that he would not tolerate having me in the house. I, have, well, I had overheard of our sons complaining about people going and hiding in places where they couldn't get to them. One of the, the places they mentioned was the Hotel de Mil Colin. If you have uh, seen the movie Hotel Rwanda, so that's the hotel. I wasn't far from it. Uh, and I knew it was safe there, but I couldn't go there because she said, well, you don't have money. I would have to get a military, high ranking military officer to come over here to take you and you have to pay him. You also have to pay at the hotel, it's not free. So that option is off the table. And then I have heard her sons talking about the church uh, that they used to go to that now had uh, people in there but they couldn't really go get them. So I asked about the church and she said, I uh, will have to drive you there, but you look too tootsie. I cannot take the risk. I don't want my constituents to see me driving a cockroach in my car. No. So we ran out of options and she finally kicked me out of her house to um, what used to be um, an outer house before they got the indoor plumbing. She said that I could stay there. She would make sure I get food. Um, so when I, I went there, um, it was in the morning. I started moving things around just a little bit so I can find a space to, you know, to sit. They had used the space as a dumping place for all the garbage. Somebody was too lazy to bring to the, you know, to the garbage place, to the city trucks to take. So I moved the garbage around. I made a little strat for me to stand. Um, and as the night came, it started raining. And then I realized that that little shade of whatever looking like uh, structure, the roof was almost gone. So the rain is just coming down. At first I felt good, you know, water, how wonderful. And then I realized that I don't have any extra clothes. So I'm soaked and it's gonna be cold because it's outside, it's night. And, um, but it was good at the same time because when the rain came, all the killers went home. Nobody wants to get wet. And because it's a thin, uh, you know, roof, it's noisy. So uh, now you can almost like have this sense of relief. Um, later on, I started feeling differently. Like my body started just feeling differently. And I thought it was because I'd been standing. I, uh, my body's kind of not used to this. I've been, for the duration of the genocide, been hiding, just laying underneath the bed. And I've been standing. So maybe my body is kind of like responding to that. But it was, it was more than that. I was actually going into labor, but I didn't realize it. So I didn't know um, so I didn't really freak out that much because now I, I have no idea what is happening and, and I have lost track of time. Um, I only realized it when it was really late, the baby was coming out. Uh, and then uh, that's a whole different scenario. What am I gonna do? I don't have clothes for her. I don't know. I don't know what to do, but whatever that I ended up doing worked, you know, we both survived. And that same, the next morning, basically people came and say, yeah, let's go. Um, I didn't have to ask where we were going. Um, I understood. 
So they took me to, uh, they took us to the killing site uh, nearby this woman's house. Um, but this was Ari May. And so the genocide had been going on for um, a month almost. Because of the pace of the killing, they were beginning to run out of people to kill. I was the very person, the first person on, at that killing site that day. And the guys who were manning it, they looked at me and the baby and they said, oh, she looks like a ghost. So they said I was too, I looked so bad in the days appetizing to be the first victim at that killing site. So they made us wait for a better looking victim to show up. Um, it didn't happen. Um, another guy who is, I guess, who had become the head of that group that was manning the, 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 the killing site, uh, when he showed up, he thought that I had some intelligence that could be useful for the army. I don't know where he got this idea from. Yes, I have not looked at myself in the mirror, but I'm pretty much sure I looked like a ghost. Uh, so he then proposed that if I give the intelligence, I have two bullets, one for me, one for my daughter, uh, because it's either you traded that or they're gonna use the machetes. It's more torture and you don't want that. So I agreed that I had the intelligence even though I had no idea what he was talking about. So he took me out of that, uh, that king side. There was a house right next to it down the street. And uh, when we got to the house, uh, it had a chain on the outside. So he opened the chain, opened the house and inside, the house was full of stuff stolen from families you could see you know cables from computers some of them missing and you could also see blood spots on the on the wall um i knew for sure that this was the ending of me i was not gonna get out of that house alive there were all kinds of signs of everything that might have taken place in there he never asked for the intelligence. He started asking me about the stuff he had at the house, uh, pointing to a computer monitor, asking if this is a television. So I, I, I quick, quickly understood that um, maybe that's what he wanted me to, to do, uh, just to sort out the stuff he had stolen. So we went through the inventory, I told him everything, what they were, what they do. And then he realized that he had stolen a lot of small kitchen appliances for some reason. I don't know why men don't cook in my, in my culture at the time, at least. So he said, okay, so he's the deal now. Um, I want to eat like rich people, wealthy people, like people ate. I wanted that kind of life. And you have to make the food. I said, okay, fine, I will make the food. He will go and find food. I don't know why he was stealing it. Sometimes he will, he, he didn't know what he brought. He brought like um, vinegar. There's no way to get salads, whatever. What else are you gonna do with vinegar? He would just grab things off the shelves in the stores where he was going to steal them. But I cooked for him and I ate every meal that I made. I made sure that it was good food. It was my food too. And part of me was like, you know, at least I'm not starving. And um, if this is gonna be my last meal, it, it has to be good. I became demanding and somehow telling him this is was, it was for him. It was just what was good for him. I asked him to get stuff and describe he wouldn't get the right stuff. But anyway, that kind of like worked. I kind of felt like I, you know, was almost, I don't know what I was thinking of doing, but I, it was one little thing that I had control over. So I did not starve. My baby didn't get sick. I had enough milk for her. Um, but 
we were almost like an object. Another thing that was in that house that he had, uh, he didn't live there. He didn't even stay there. He didn't really spend time. He came to the house, bringing more stuff or taking stuff out and to get his food. And that was about it. But the instructions were clear. If the food is not good enough, you're gone, you're dead. So as the world got closer to where we were though, he started taking some of those valuables outside of the house and uh, taking trips outside of the city. And one of those days he never came back because he couldn't come back. Uh, they have lost the city. And that's the only reason I'm alive and my daughter is alive. He wasn't around. He wasn't around. If he would have been around, he, he would have he would have killed us before he fled or something. So uh, by the time the genocide was over, when the the um, the government, I guess, took over, came over, it was there was no there was no one around to to kind of kill us. And with that, um, we found out, we started finding out that people have passed away. Basically, my husband didn't make it. Uh, and then you start getting stories about the rest of your family, my, my dad, my sister, my cousins, my, my aunts and uncles. I don't have any aunt or uncle. Um, my classmates and my teachers, basically the story goes um, like that. But I was fortunate. Uh, compared to many other people who went through the same similar experience, I, I came out with a new life. Not just me. Um, many mothers lost their kids. And that kind of like kept me going. I know I went over time. Um, I don't even know where we are now. But if we have time, I would be happy to take the questions um, from you. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, thank you so much for sharing your really powerful story with us, Eugenie. Um, I think we're almost out of time. We might have time for a couple of questions and then for people who do have questions and you know, don't get them in, you can always email legacy at ccm.edu and you know, we can send them on to you, uh, Eugenie. Yeah, I will, I will answer them. Uh, so one question that we do have that maybe you could answer before um, we end is, you know, how did you come to the United States? Yeah, that's another long story in itself, but um, I ran into a human rights uh, worker, the, a UN human rights worker uh, in Rwanda, and we talked briefly at the phone, um, like a phone company, we were all trying to get technicians to fix our phones. And we became friends and she asked me what I wanted to do after the genocide. I said I wanted to get away from, uh, from I, I think I think I used the word crime scene. I wanted to get away from, from there just to have some kind of normalcy. Um, and um, I started looking into schools and I, I picked the College of St. Rose because my daughter's middle name is Rose. And it turns out she's also from Albany. So that was in her backyard, basically. And that's how the whole story kind of started. I ended up in Albany. I had no idea it was going to be so cold. Hmm. And I know, I mean, we don't have time to answer this, but like sometime I would love to hear if you were present in Rwanda for the whole truth and reconciliation process that the United Nations oversaw. and. Um, you know, how you thought that worked and I mean, that's a huge question, so. Uh. Yeah, well, it depends on it. So different people got different things out of it. Um, I think from survivors, um, uh, one thing that was important for us is to, uh, to find, to get the stories obviously of where the people's uh, who have been killed and whose bodies have not been found where they were. Um, so sometimes you got that and that was the most important thing. Um, 
The second thing uh, was to identify the people who have committed crimes. And sometimes that happened, or sometimes they, they all say we collectively did it, so you will know exactly. Uh, if you ask more like, stories of what really happened and some of the perpetrators, they decided to use that as the opportunity to inflict even more pain. So there's a way you can describe how somebody, you know, what happened. And, and there's a way you can do it in the most brutal, hateful ways so that the person now leaves even more wounded by the information they get. Uh, you know, the laughter is almost, it's almost like a theatrical uh, presentation. It made it sometimes hard for people to see through the proceedings. But also, um, there are some brave people in the communities who were able to identify um, their neighbors and say, he is the one who did this. Uh, and knowing that they will remain neighbors for the rest of the, their lives almost, people don't move that much um, in Rwanda. And knowing that they, by revealing that information, they're endangering themselves and they're endangering their families, but they're choosing to tell the truth. Um, so those people made it, the process uh, possible. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing this powerful story. I mean, you know, I think many of us are reflecting, we don't, don't have time to answer the question, but I see it in the chat that as you talked about the sort of growth of negative language and the growth of propaganda, I think many of us were thinking of the recent siege on the Capitol and of white supremacist groups within the United States. So, you know, maybe just in, in, in closing, that's something that all of us might want to think about as well as we walk away from your story. But thank you so much, Eugenie Mukashimana, for, for sharing that with us. It's incredibly powerful. And um, just thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. And I'm sorry that you, know, you didn't have the time to ask all the questions. OK, so goodbye to everybody. Bye. <laughs>